welcome. We have these on the first Tuesday of every month. And we use this meeting to give the community a chance to meet and share ideas, as well as ask any questions to the DAX report team. Uh, today, we have two really interesting presentations lined up. First, we'll have Dennis Hume, a staff data engineer from Drizzly. We'll talk about how Drizzly configures its DAX deployments to support heterogeneous teams. And then we'll have Noah from Geomagical Labs. We'll talk about how they use Daxter to build customer facing applications. If you have any questions in the presentations, feel free to drop them in the Zoom chat or save them until the end. We'll have a Q&A session to close out the meeting. Um, also a small note for future community meetings. If you have a topic that you'd like to present and share with the community, please reach out to us on Slack. Um, you can re reach out to me, I'm Tashank on Slack, and we'd love to chat, about you, chat with you to have a presentation at one of these future meetings. So without any further ado, I'll hand it off to Dennis to give his presentation. Okay. So hi, I'm Dennis. I'm a data engineer at uh, Drizzly. And just kind of wanted to go over how uh, Drizzly's kind of adopted Dagster and tried to make this something that works for our entire team. Oops. And there we go. Okay. So the Drizzly data team is pretty similar to, I think, most data teams. We're kind of a collection of analysts, data scientists, and data engineers who kind of all have very different needs out of our data stack. Um, and really what brought us to Dagster was just the idea that like every everyone can kind of get something different from Dagster and there's just a lot of universal appeal. So when we kind of started rebuilding our data infrastructure about two years or a year and a half ago, we tried to build it along this line of like of shared spaces. We didn't really want anyone's workflow to be, to feel very different from anyone else's. We didn't want uh, a data scientist to feel like what they do is very different from an analyst. And we didn't want data silos to emerge of, it's a very different workflow for someone on marketing versus someone on strategic partnerships. So when we're doing, creating our shared spaces, we wanted things to follow the same workflows, be able to leverage the work of the entire team and um, allow members to be able to push changes without having to worry about any infrastructure and just be able to iterate quickly. So we started this by um, building out shared spaces around the SQL um, world. So this is, I think, pretty common at this point of just using a combination of DBT and Snowflake. Uh, between the two, we really had the flexibility to be able to uh, configure warehouses or um, databases to specific teams. Um, we could also just hold all of our logic in one place with DBT. And then it really just never felt that different if you were building a a data science SQL model or uh, a model that would be going into our, our visualization layer for marketing or something else. So that worked really well. What was a harder question was how we were going to build out a shared space for non-SQL workflows because here the differences and needs kind of become a lot more apparent. So this is where we've kind of been hoping Dagster can fill that role and what we've been moving forward with Dagster. So for people who've been using Dagster for a while, um, you're probably familiar with a lot of these abstractions of just the differences between solids and pipelines and modes and presets. Um, but the main thing with this is just that kind of going back to Dagster, it, appeals to different roles for different reasons. Um, we really didn't want it to be a barrier that in order to contribute to the Dagster project, you really needed to know every one of these abstraction layers. Um, so if you're an analyst just wanting to get a pipeline off the ground, you really shouldn't have to worry about the different workspaces and you shouldn't really have to worry about configuring your own resources because you should be just leveraging resources we've already used of already having defined our Snowflake or DBT resources. So when we thought of how we should uh, configure these environments to kind of work for everyone and be consistent across roles, we started by thinking how we should use modes within Dagster. So 
we divided these up into local, dev, and prod. Um, local mode is every resource is mocked. Um, this usage is for kind of quick local development and unit testing of pipelines. So as an example, instead of actually uh, pinging Snowflake, this could just be uh, some files saved that just mimic what the results of a Snowflake query would be. Um, our dev mode can be mocked or non-production versions of a system. So this could be for sticking with that Snowflake um, example, this could be something like pinging a staging table with a limit on the query. And this, again, is more just for integration testing and maybe um, confirming the, the schema that we're using. And then prod is for production systems. So <clears throat> how we kind of wrap all this together is our different deployments of Dagster. And we have four different deployments. Um, we have local, which is just running Dagster from within a virtual environment. And this is specific to one workspace. And this is for just, again, quickly getting your pipeline to, um, to be able to compile and be able to just like check it. Um, we have a Dagster Compose setup, which again is just for uh, your local machine, but this um, starts to bring in more of the Dagster dependencies such as the Postgres uh, database, the daemon, uh, we're working with on creating a broker and so this is for just kind of more involved testing. So you can get that, uh, see that every aspect of your pipeline is working correctly. Then after this, we start to actually like push um, code into Git and based on the branch you're going to, you can, it will be deployed either to our dev environment, which is just our AWS stack on our dev account or prod, which is just the same stack, but just on our prod AWS account. Um, the other thing we do to kind of limit some of the um, confusion over this, the different deployments are we do filtering across um, our different deployments. So we do filtering on pipelines, modes, presets, and schedules. And this is just to make it easy to know what all you should have available to you within a specific de uh, deployment. We just handle all this with um, environment variables, but this just makes it so that if you're running Dagster locally, you don't accidentally trigger a, pr a production run or you don't accidentally um, try and run something on dev when you don't really have the resources to um, run it in that environment. So our local deployment just look is very much just running Dagit against a specific repo. Um, at this point, the only, as I've mentioned, the only modes you have available are local and the Dagster configuration is none because there's no um, additional uh, dependencies. So this is kind of what the instance looks like. Um, and then in object filtering, you just have access to local um, local mode and, and presets and you don't have uh, avail uh, any of the schedules available. Moving up to our Docker environment, um, this is when it starts to, we really start to take advantage of just the flexibility of Dagster and being able to run different Dagster instances and in different deployments. So here we can use pretty much what we're gonna be using in production, except uh, we can use like the Docker launcher instead of um, a custom like ECS launcher that we'd use in AWS. And this again is just allows us to keep moving our code along and get closer and closer to what it would look like in actual production without actually having to get to that step quite yet. Um, so here the instance is different because we um, have a different workspace where we have multiple um, repositories now. We have the BI repository and the data science repository, which is broken in this screenshot and I think is gonna be broken in my demo. Um, and then you can see that the, uh, the Dagster daemon is running in this environment. And for object filtering, you now have access to both local and dev for presets and modes and now have schedules present. So our dev, our, our dev deployment is just, um, again, this is what we're starting to uh, get to what it will look like in production. So this is just Dagster running on AWS resources. Um, so we are just kind of built our own stack around ECS. We don't use 
EKS for um, our deployment of Dagster, but this is pretty much, again, it looks pretty similar to Docker Compose, but again, we're just using AWS resources at this point. And then our production stack is the exact same stack, but just on a different account. So one thing that's kind of holding this all together are our data scientists have put together some very nice cookie cutter templates. And this allows us to just very easily spin up um, new pipelines that adhere to our deployments. So this again, just makes it easier for people to be able to quickly get a pipeline off the ground and not have to worry about just all the, all the infrastructure in the back. You can just focus on the logic of your pipeline, which just makes this easier to get set up and running. So quick demo. Um, I mean, just kind of, this will be pretty similar to um, the slides, but we can just go through a pipeline that um, I've we've been working on with an analyst recently. Should have started this before the presentation, but that's hindsight. There it is. Okay, so this inventory cost analysis or cost pipeline is just a integration pipeline where um, we read in a day's worth of S3 files, do some mapping to determine which files we actually need to bring in and then dynamically generate a Snowflake copy statement to load in that day's files. So at this point, um, the resources being used are Snowflake and S3, but since we're in local mode, this will all just be mocked. So we can run this pipeline. Um, it will run, but it won't actually be doing much just because the S3, it's not connected to S3. So this is just pretty much to um, make sure that our pipeline compiles and we can see it um, in the Dagster UI. And then also that we can write unit tests. So we can write unit tests still that um, ensure that that mapping is running correctly. But if we also, instead of, oops, So we can also run the same pipeline in our Docker Compose setup. And so I'll just reload the BI workflow. Okay. So now, so yeah, here we have uh, access to dev and local. Um, so we can run this with dev. And this time it's actually gonna be hitting our um, dev S3 bucket. And you can see this is still kind of a work in progress, but we're actually did hit the um, dev S3 bucket and did the mapping on just kind of a sample of what the files would look like and generated the, the copy statement. Though Snowflake is still mocked at this point. So we're not actually running the, um, the copy into our table. The other thing that's uh, different in our Docker Compose setup is just since we have the daemon running, we can see a schedule for this. And one thing with the way we do schedules um, is just we have um, multiple schedules for the same pipeline that are just keyed to the different modes. So again, there's one for dev and one for prod but if you look in the schedules for uh, this environment, you only see the schedule for, mo uh, for development. And that again is just to kind of keep it a little simple and um, you don't have to make changes by like um, testing something out in 
one environment and then if you forget to change it, um, it accidentally getting pushed to prod or something like that. So yeah, so that's pretty much where we are. I think we're still adopting Dagster and just getting it more of a universal skill set on the team, kind of the same way DBT and Snowflake is. But the we've been, I think we've been happy with um, progress so far. It just it's really nice to be able to take advantage of what's already there and not having to start from scratch with every pipeline and feel that you have to be doing a lot of additional work for things that we've done in the past that are similar. Um, if you want to learn more about kind of bridging the Dagster, DVT, Snowflake all together in one place, our uh, infrastructure lead, uh, Emily, uh, gave a talk at DVT Coalesce in, I think that was November or December of last year, but um, it's a Snowflake DBT talk primarily, but there's also Dagsters kind of under the hood for that. And that's all I've got. Cool. Thank you, Dennis. The team here is always so excited to see when we see Dennis's setup because how they use Dagster to enable local development testing, the local dev staging and prod layering is very slick. Um, so next up we have Noah. The Zoom stage is yours. Awesome. Um, thank you, Chuck. Uh, I'm Noah. I'm a principal site reliability engineer for GF Magical Labs. And like I said, I'm going to talk about our approach to Dagster. Um, our use case isn't quite the normal one for Dagster. So a quick overview of our main product. A uh, user takes a bunch of imagery of their room using our mobile app. They upload those to our cloud stuff. We run a bunch of fancy math. We build a 3D view of their room. And then they can, in a browser or mobile app, drag virtual furniture in to see how it would look before buying. So the key points there are that it's directly customer facing, so we need it to run quickly, and there's very little margin for error because every second counts when a customer's waiting on us. Also, the fancy math that we run can get very, very fancy. Uh, some of the steps vary from little Python scripts to large C++ tools that use tens of gigabytes of RAM and require a GPU. Before we dive into the DAG setup, let's look what we had before. For our main product, we use Celery with RabbitMQ, each solid, to use the Dagster term, although it wasn't that before, uh, runs its own deployment in Kubernetes, and we have a custom tool to compile from a simple JSON DAG representation Canvas orchestration system that comes with Celery. We knew we wanted to keep most of the structure of our existing solids in place, both because updating them would be really costly, and honestly, that part of the system was going just fine in terms of workflow. The big problem was that our DAG was limited and can this didn't really offer much room for improvement. We've tried a couple times and it didn't work for inexplicable reasons. So Canvas definitely had to go. Also, our workloads are really bursty. So anything that allows us to shut down more capacity when it's not in use helps us to keep costs down, which is really nice when you're allocating giant cloud machines. Uh, and also, if we could get better run tracking with more detailed information, that would be really nice. I mean, I can write all that instrumentation myself, but if I don't have to, that's great. Uh, obviously, we found and liked Dagster. You wouldn't be hearing from me today. Uh, but in short, it ticked all of the boxes I was looking for. And anything that it didn't, we could help to improve. So the biggest thing that we're looking to improve on uh, is the thing I'm talking about today, which is a getting a scalable, stable execution layer in place. Uh, because we needed really high potential concurrency and much higher resiliency to failure, the default launcher and executor combos weren't going to cut it. We did look at Dagster Celery, since we knew we wanted Celery under the hood no matter what. Fortunately, the workflow for that more or less requires that the code for all solids lives alongside the pipeline, or at least that all solids in the pipeline uh, can be runnable together. That wouldn't really work well for us because of the widely varying hardware requirements for different solids. Uh, there's also Dagster Kubernetes, which launches Kubernetes jobs on the fly. Uh, this can be okay for infrequently executed jobs where failure or delay doesn't have any customer facing comp consequences, but I really, really suggest that you keep Kube API server out of the hot path of your product. Uh, it's really just not built for that kind of thing. That's putting on my Kubernetes hat instead of Dagster hat. Um, I'll save some back and forth and cut to what we came up with. Um, so the normal stuff, Daggett runs as a Kubernetes deployment. That's pretty standard. Uh, and we wrote a custom launcher plugin that takes the run request, serializes it into JSON, puts that onto a Celery queue, and then each uh, Dagster workspace 
has a celery daemon that is sort of the launcher daemon. So it gets those requests off of RabbitMQ, deserializes it and acts as the executor. And then uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later. Most of our solids are also running as separate daemons like they were before um, with some proxies to get back and forth. I mentioned before, one of our big goals was being able to scale our system down when not in, when not in use. Dagster delivers that nicely. Um, the minimum system state with what I showed before uh, is just Daggett and one copy of the gRPC daemon for each workspace running. Uh, all told, that uses very few resources, almost no CPU, and just a little bit of RAM. Uh, because everything is decoupled via RabbitMQ, we use a tool called Keda to watch the queue depth in RabbitMQ and drive our auto scaling. Um, and we've updated some stuff in Keda 2.1 uh, with a bunch of new features to make this use case work better. Two important things on the Celery side, if you're going to try something like this, the messages need to stay in the queue while they're being processed so that Keda can see them for auto scaling purposes. And the way you do that in Celery is with tasks act late uh, and either reducing or disabling prefetching. So that stuff stays in the queue until it's actually been processed completely. Remote solids are pretty much our biggest deviation from normal Dagster usage. Uh, most people, like I said before, keep their solids all the same code base as the pipeline, and that works great for most people that are just running some pretty simple Python code. But we want to run all of ours as separate daemons. So the plus sides of that are great. We can tailor the execution environment, things like hardware requirements, Docker base images, sometimes even which operating systems to run on, because we have one thing that runs on Windows. Um, and it also means that the teams that are developing each solid can be somewhat isolated from their usage and pipelines, not completely. The use cases still matter, but they can sort of develop and release on their own schedule. We can run multiple versions of each solid in parallel, and the pipelines can pick which versions of things they want to use. So we can do sort of a gentle promotion cycle. If a new version of something isn't working great in the pipeline, um, we can go back to sending to the old version, which is still running just fine. Uh, this is a simple use case of remote solid. It looks an awful lot like a Celery task because it is a Celery task. Uh, there, we have some helpers to just sort of help define them more quickly. Uh, but overall, it's just normal Celery. Um, each of these would be in its own uh, GitHub project, have its own CI, its own everything. Uh, we could expose multiple tasks from a single remote solid if the situation called for it, but it doesn't come up very often. Most of them have one thing that they do. But then we need to expose that remote solid into Dagster's view of the world. Uh, so we've written a decorator that extends at solid to create what I call proxy solids. And this is a short example of one. So the decorator takes all the same arguments as at solid, but some additional ones, like say which RabbitMQ this solid will live on. The first yield is yielding what arguments should be sent to the remote celery task, because usually, as you can see here, that's like extracting some data from the Dagster level arguments. And then the return from the first yield will be output from the remote solid. So whatever Celery returned will end up in output there. And then after that, you can do normal Dagster stuff, data manipulation, yielding outputs, asset materializations, all that kind of stuff. Our workflow is pretty light after that. Um, each overall project has its own Git repository for the pipelines. Um, one of those will be the default pipeline in main.py um, that sort of defines when a customer request comes in that doesn't have an override for which pipeline to use since they are the, the pipelines are also versioned. Um, it'll use the default one. Um, we have the solids.py for defining all of those proxy solids. Uh, and then other stuff when we want to sort of write a new test pipeline, we'll write that in some other file. When we're happy that it's working well, we can rename it into place to be the new default. Um, or some of them are just for testing purposes or whatever and always stay in their own files forever. Um, we use the Daggett GraphQL API to integrate into our backend APIs for things like launching new executions via one of the GraphQL mutations uh, or just like discovering which pipelines exist for admin UI purposes. Uh, as we roll out this workflow to more internal projects, the goal is for the teams that currently own the JSON-based DAG definitions to take over writing Dagster pipelines instead. They're very excited about that. As soon as I let them, they're ready for it. Uh, the current one is not great. Um, 
And just quickly, uh, we have all of this wrapped in a continuous deployment system via build kite. So any commit get, gets merged into the main branch for either a solid or a uh, pipeline will be uh, built into a container image, edited into the customized configuration, uh, pushed up into GitHub, and then deployed via Argo CD. Um, there's a little bit more complexity in some of the fancier remote solids because there's an operator because I'm that kind of nerd. Um, but overall, fairly simple, straightforward system. Just as soon as you merge it, it ends up in the system. Uh, but this whole setup isn't without issues. The biggest downside is the time to cold start a pipeline that hasn't been used lately. Uh, we have one pipeline in particular that it can take 10 to 20 minutes before things actually get underway because the machines it has to launch are fairly large and the container images are many gigabytes. Um, because uh, most of the work is in the remote solids, we also don't yet have any way to show progress or status information during a long step. Um, so in that proxy solid definition I showed before, like you can use the Dagster log before and after, but once the celery task is running, you're blocked until it comes back. There's not a whole lot that can actually happen usefully during that. Um, this makes debugging a lot harder. If something goes wrong during a, a task, we have to sort of cross correlate between the Dagster logs and the low level Kubernetes output logs. Uh, and finally, as with any off the beaten path adventure, we've hit plenty of weird edge cases, uh, a whole bunch from Celery because it really, really doesn't like being both a consumer and producer in the same daemon. But if you're doing weird stuff, you're going to hit weird bugs. We haven't moved our main product yet, as I've been sort of hinting at throughout this. We've been using a lot of smaller projects to develop and battle test this execution layer. And so far, things are looking very positive. Um, we can throw uh, hundreds of simultaneous runs into the system and have them come out the other side. Uh, the main blog blocking, no, main bug blocking us from moving forward in the rollout is every now and then we do have unexplained task failures for no obvious reason. I think it's a RabbitMQ timeout, uh, but I need to add more debugging output, and I think we'll be back on track soon. And there's still also a lot of room to improve it. Uh, the biggest thing that would improve this would be async execution support. Uh, right now, because the execution process itself is synchronous, and because we want to run very high concurrency, most of the time for us, it's going to be blocked in waiting for the remote celery task to return. So we don't want to run the overhead of a separate process for every one of those. So we're using threads. Uh, we run 15 threads per workspace level worker, um, which works great, except that I don't think anyone else using Dagster is doing multi-threaded execution. Uh, and so we've run into a couple of weird bugs related to that. Uh, but a fully async executor would allow for better time sharing for both our weird use case and everyone else. Um, we'd also like to fix that incremental feedback gap or just more generally have ways for non Dagster systems to yield events into the Dagster log, um, the Dagster event framework. Um, and another thing that we're looking at is pipeline level webhooks. Um, there's been a ticket open for this recently. Uh, right now, it's really easy to deal with successes. We just have a solid that notifies our backend system when the thing is finished. But if it fails, we have to pull GraphQL for that because uh, we don't know where it will fail. Um, and it could fail at a point where we can't define any hooks. So having a, a pipeline level hook for failures in particular would allow us to automatically notify our backend system and maybe it shows the user an error or retries or something like that. Hopefully by now I've convinced at least some of you this is a pretty good way to run Dagster. I clearly think it is. Um, our solids and pipelines aren't public, but the core helper library is. Uh, you can look it up on GitHub, geomagical slash Dagster geomagical, but... It is extremely undocumented, and I'm still really frequently making major changes to it. So think of this as a place to borrow code and ideas from. Please don't try and import and use it directly. I feel like that's not going to go well. Uh, and that's it. Um, thank you so much. And I think we'll be taking questions either in chat or on Zoom or some permutation of that. Sweet. Thank you, Noah.